You know, in many, many middle and upper class communities, I really agree with Hera. There are parents who are swooping in to resolve minor peer conflicts. There are parents who are maneuvering to get their kids on winning teams. And in all these ways, they are patronizing their kids and um, conveying a pretty dismal expect, assumption or expectation about what their kids are capable of. And, and, and I do and I do worry about that. I also worry about, um, and this may sound odd, but the amount of talk that parents are having um, with young kids about their feelings. And I think it's super important for parents to get kids to identify and articulate their feelings. And especially boys, we have to get boys to identify and articulate their feelings. But, you know, sometimes I'm on playgrounds and I see parents saying, that must make you sad or that must make you angry or that must make you frustrated every 10 minutes. And I worry it causes parents, kids to turn their inner lives into theater and to become too occupied about how they're feeling moment to moment. Good evening and welcome to tonight's Jonathan Seaman Hot Buttons Cool Conversations discussion series at JCC, JCC Greater Boston. Um, tonight we're virtual. Um, my name is Gavin Andrews. I'm the Chief Strategic Program Officer at the JCC and we're so happy you're here with us tonight. This series invites distinguished public figures to engage in conversation on thought-provoking and stimulating subjects. Our panelists are led by expert moderators through respectful and timely discussions on issues of concern to the Jewish community and beyond. And so tonight we're very excited and as a parent, I'm even more excited to bring you tonight's program, The Parent Trap. Are we raising wimps or warriors? For decades, parents have been, been, been bombarded by messages imploring them to do more for their children. And there has been a cultural shift expecting parents to do everything from playing to problem solving for their children. So tonight we ask, in an effort to protect our children, have we actually stripped them of their basic coping capabilities? And we'll look at the impact of the pandemic and social media that uh, had taken on our children and how different parenting styles affect child development. So on our panel tonight, we have Katie Hurley, child and adolescent psychotherapist, parenting educator and writer. She is the author of several books, including No More Mean Girls and The Happy Kid Handbook, How to Raise Joyful Children in a Stressful World. We also have Hera Estroff Morano, who is editor at large of Psychology Today magazine. She has written extensively on the culture of hyper parenting and is the author of three books, including A Nation of Wimps, The High Cost of Invasive Parenting. Richard Weisbord, senior lecturer at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and the Kennedy School of Government. Rick directs the Making Caring Common Project, a national effort to make moral and social development priorities in child raising. And then lastly, moderating our conversation this evening is Peter Gray, a research professor in psychology and neuroscience at Boston College. He is the author of the acclaimed introductory psychology textbook and writes a blog for Psychology Today called Freedom to Learn. So before we begin our program, I'd like to thank our donors. Without their philanthropic support, we would not be able to produce tonight's program. We appreciate their commitment to fulfilling the mission of both Hot Buttons Cool Conversations and the JCC. So I'd love to turn things over to Peter and get this evening started. Thank you, Gavin, and, uh, and welcome to everybody who is uh, listening in uh, and watching on this. Um, I think this is an extraordinarily important issue, an extraordinarily important topic for our times. So I want to just uh, set the context um, very, very quickly uh, for the discussion by saying that, you know, I'm assuming that uh, this question, are we raising wimps or warriors? Um, I probably don't have to say this, but I don't, I think we're using the word warriors metaphorically here. Uh, we're not necessarily wanting to raise people to run off to war. We're talking about emotional strength, I think, that we're talking about, are we raising uh, 
our children in a way that leads to the kind of emotional strength that allows them to face life's challenges without uh, breaking down. Um, I think that's what we mean by warriors in, in various ways. And by wimps, I guess we just mean the opposite of that. Somebody who is relatively emotionally fragile, uh, breaks down in response to the regular stressors of life. I think that what we can all agree on at the beginning, uh, because the data is overwhelming, is that young people today are breaking down at record rates. We have record levels of anxiety, of depression, of suicide, never before in the recorded history of, of this. And, and this has been studied using objective tests, unchanged psychological tests over the years. The rates of anxiety, the rates of depression, the rates of suicide at the extreme uh, keep going up and they are at record levels now. They've been going up ever since the 1960s, uh, somewhat gradually, with a somewhat of an inflection in the 1980s, where they increased at a somewhat more rapid rate than they did before or after. And again, we're seeing another fairly rapid increase in the last 20 years or so, especially the last 10 years. So uh, with that introduction, let me throw the question out to the panel and in the most general way. Um, what do you see as uh, as the reasons for this heightened these heightened problems that um, young people are experiencing emotionally? What do you see as the cause? What is it in our society? How is society affecting parents? Um, is it have to do with parenting, or does it have to do with something entirely different? Um, whoever wants to begin, uh, I would say that the way we could operate is just raise your hand literally or use the uh, use the raise hand like this, whichever you prefer. So Hara, Hara. So um, I would say as a reporter, this is a question that uh, got thrust at me um, a little more than a decade ago. And um, I became aware of the rising rates of anxiety and depression on college campuses. And I put out a survey. I actually surveyed campus uh, counseling center directors. And I heard directly from over 500 of them. And they said unanimously, um, that what was going on was that kids were coming to school without coping skills. Um, their parents were doing everything for them, taking all the lumps and bumps out of uh, their childhood, pushing them to achieve, to get into the best college um, that they could. Uh, and this is something that I have been following for um, more than a decade now. And I just do want to report some kind of sobering statistics um, just from the most recent survey of the American College Health Association. So the latest data, 41% of female students experience anxiety interfering with academic performance. 28% experience crippling depression. 47% of all students report that stress impairs them. More than 50% rate high on loneliness. It's kind of amazing that loneliness is a huge problem uh, among this generation. 30% um, test positive on suicide ideation. I don't know the exact number of self-harm and self-mutilation. I do know it's a huge and growing problem, um, and especially uh, among girls. So I think we have to take seriously what um, the counseling center directors are saying because they're in close, intimate uh, contact um, with these students and notice it as a huge change. Uh, particularly in the, around the turn of the millennium, there was just a, a major leap. But as Peter said, it's been going on for some time. 
Thank you, Hera. Does uh, somebody else want to jump in on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I, I, I very much agree with Hera about this issue around college campuses. I would point out that, you know, about half of kids at any between 1825 aren't on a college campus. And I think there are big race, class, and culture differences mm -hmm. in what we're talking about. Um, and I don't think the problem in many low-income low and working-class communities is a, is a lack of coping strategies. I, I think that's it's much more a problem in middle upper class communities. Um, I think achievement pressure, in addition, is a huge problem in middle upper class communities and an increasing problem over the time period we've been talking about. I think intergenerational poverty is a huge issue and feelings of helplessness and hopelessness in many low-income communities in this country and marginalization and racism and you know a whole set of other things that have been going on for a long time but are not abating and um, can cause people, to kids, to feel anxious and, and depressed. Um, you know, we have a particular spike among LGBTQIA students too that you know I think has different origins. So. I'm just my, I'm just suggesting that I find this hard problem to address generically because I think there are the puzzle with many pieces and different pieces are interacting in different ways in different communities. Thank you, Rick. Uh, um, Katie, did you want to uh, add uh, yeah, some thoughts so, here? <laughs> I do, <laughs> and I I agree with, and you're going to hear me say this a lot. But I think I agree with a lot of what Rick just said, and. You know, the, the social worker in me wants to say we really need to take an intersectional lens to this problem. We can't just when to focus on achievement pressure, which is real, and to focus on over parenting, which is also real in some cases, is a very privileged position to take. You know, we have teens, tweens, young adults struggling for a myriad of reasons in our country and without sufficient resources. So we really have to look at why are we where we are? Um, you know, being someone who's a bit of a, a girl expert <laughs> in the field, you know, people look to me to, well, why are teenage girls cutting at the rate that they're cutting? And there's no simple answer to that, but I would also kick that back with why are teenage boys allowed to walk around in very misogynistic clothing and uh, treat, you know, female identifying students the way they are allowed to treat them on campuses and out in the community without any one inter intervening and saying, let's do things differently. We need to teach you differently. So I think, and then we, like Rick mentioned, our LGBTQIA population is struggling at times. Um, so, you know, we have to really come at this problem from every angle and really get in the weeds and talk to the kids, which is what I do, you know, every day of the week in my practice. But we really need more people out in the weeds talking to these young people and finding out what's really underneath the surface for them. Yeah, I totally agree that this is a, the wimps or warriors question I'm interpreting. Um, and the phenomenon that I've been reporting on, I would say is almost exclusively a problem of the middle, upper middle and upper classes. Um, and I, I think that the data bear that out um, very clearly. Um, and uh, so I wish that some of the hyper attention that parents pay to the kids, the over attention, I wish that some of that could be diverted and focused on the kids who don't get uh, as much and need more uh, parental attention or could benefit from more parental attention. We've got this real mismatch going in the culture. So I would, I would, here, I'm not sure if you're saying this, but you know, low-income kids are very attentive. Low-income parents are very attentive to their kids um, un, under very difficult circumstances. I, would, I totally agree with that. Yes. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not implying that they're neglecting their kids. I think they're they're facing a lot of struggles that divert their attention yeah, um, and and time from their kids. No, I'm totally sympathetic to uh, their struggle. And there are also differences in how kids are raised. So, you know, um, and Peter knows this more than the rest of us sitting here, but in terms of extended families and, uh, you know, allo parenting and who jumps in to help. And, you know, so when we look at different cultural practices and different income levels, we also see uh, 
that families look very different. So it's hard to, it's, sometimes it's difficult to weed out the differences because we're so diverse, which is great, right? But we have to meet everybody where they are instead of generalizing. I think that's super important right now. I, I very much agree with that point, Katie. But I wonder if I can interject another thing. For, this is partly based, on, I'll, I'll give it as a personal observation, but there's also data on this. I do a lot of bicycling and it used to be, 20 years ago, I'd bicycle in different parts of Worcester and I would go into the working class areas and I'd see kids outdoors playing and in the wealthier areas, I never saw kids out playing. Now I don't see kids out playing anywhere. <laughs> I don't see it. I think it's trickled down. I think that this uh, kind of over control mm -hmm. and part of the reason I would argue is that uh, parents are afraid of uh, the police if they're being accused of neglect, um, if, uh, if they're not watching their children all the time. And if you're poor and black, there's, uh, if, you're ri if you're wealthy enough to hire a lawyer, you will not have your children taken away. But there's a chance your children will take it away for neglect for doing what used to be common everyday parenting. Let your kids go out and play. <laughs> Yes, play is a huge issue for uh, a number of reasons. Um, and part of the problem, um, part of the reason play has been taken away, um, the, the shift of parental um, attention to pushing their kids to achieve has, if you're adding on activities, if you're adding on um, homework, if you're adding on that that push, what you're taking away is the opportunity to play. And um, I think it's a big mistake. I think it's a big error. I think people have a lot of mistaken assumptions about play being frivolous, trivial, when in fact, we know it's a brain builder, a flexibility builder, prepares kids for adaptability for the future. And it's kind of exactly what kids need rather than less of it, even when the demands are greater, um, even when there are great academic demands. I know, Peter, this is a topic you're particularly interested in. I suppose you have something to say too. And I might add, you know, it's, I, I write about play and emphasize play, but children are not just being deprived of play, they're being deprived of all sorts of act opportunities to do things that require independence, responsibility. Kids, for the most part, don't have part-time jobs anymore. You know, you can't have a paper route, you can't do babysitting, you can't mow lawn, they're not mowing lawns, they're not doing things independently like that. Why is that? They're not, um, I, in my neighborhood, I see, I see across, the street and this is very common this is not just this is everywhere the parents are driving their car out the driveway <laughs> to wait for their child to get off the bus so the child doesn't have to walk up the driveway <laughs> to the house after getting off the school bus and these are children these are not infants these are not five and six year olds these are kids in middle elementary school kids who in the past would have walked to school all the time. So why, why, are we, why are we doing this? And what is the consequence of that when we treat our, ch when children are being treated like fragile eggshells? So, you know, the, it, there are a lot of reasons why, but I want to address one of the consequences. And when we do that, kids are paying attention. Uh, we think we're helping them when, in fact, by doing those things for them, we are communicating to them in deeds that we don't think they're capable of doing it themselves. And they take they they internalize that message and they believe in their own fragility. Uh, and I think that's one way, seriously, that we're weakening them from within. Yeah, I, I guess I'd say two, two Katie, you wanna go ahead? You go, go ahead, Rick. Oh. I, I guess I would say two things um, about this. And one, um, Peter, I'm gonna 
be a little bit of a broken record about this, but you know, again, a lot of low income working class kids have a lot of independence. They're taking care of sick relatives, they're supervising younger siblings, they are working to support their families. So again, I think that's um in you know largely a class-based um phenomena. I I do think that um you know, in many, many middle and upper class communities, I really agree with Hera. There are parents who are swooping in to resolve minor peer conflicts. There are parents who are maneuvering to get their kids on winning teams. And in all these ways, they are patronizing their kids and um, conveying a pretty dismal expect, assumption or expectation about what their kids are capable of. And, 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 I, do, and I do worry about that. I also worry about... Um, and this may sound odd, but the amount of talk that parents are having um, with young kids about their feelings. And I think it's super important for parents to get kids to identify and articulate their feelings, and especially boys. We have to get boys to identify and articulate their feelings. But, you know, sometimes I'm on playgrounds and I see parents saying, that must make you sad or that must make you angry or that must make you frustrated every 10 minutes. And... I worry it causes parents, kids to turn their inner lives into theater and to become too occupied about how they're feeling moment to moment. Again, I think that's more of a middle and upper class phenomenon than a low income phenomenon. But um, I think the self is at stake too much um, in, for a lot of kids. And that can also increase their sense of fragility. And if we tune kids into other kids more and focus less on how they were feeling moment to moment, they would have better relationships their whole lives. And those relationships are powerfully protective. Yeah, you know, it sounds like what you're talking about is a recipe for narcissism. You know, totally focused on oneself all the time, that tuning into feelings. Yes, it's good to a degree, but it can be dramatically um, overdone and kids get the sense that their feelings are the most important thing in the world, instead of turning attention out to some of the other problems in the world. Um, but I no, do want to add something no, no. on 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 the the class issue and this phenomenon of overprotection being um, affecting the. Um, middle and upper middle classes um, to a degree, to a degree the parents, I guess, wouldn't want if they knew what the, the consequences were. Um, but I, I can summarize it in one little anecdote where I was flying out to Los Angeles, happened to be seated next to um, a senior VP for Goldman Sachs. I don't know a parent who wouldn't want their kid to be hired by Goldman Sachs uh, out, just out of college. And um, when she asked me what I was going out there to talk about, um, she quickly said to me, you know, I'm not a parent, but I hire tons of kids. She said, I will no longer hire the air quotes here, fancy kids, um, I will hire only the children of first generation uh, immigrants, first generation going to college. They haven't had anyone running interference for them. They've learned how to solve problems on their own. And I thought that's as telling a comment uh, as you can get. Katie, did you want to add something? Yes, I have a question. That'll well, I want to add you. like a, a hundred things, but I won't. But I, <laughs> so, <laughs> I want to point out a couple of things. One is that parents are anxious right now. And I'm not defending over parenting, but I, I believe that parents are very anxious. I see it in my practice when I'm traveling, speaking at schools all across the country. There is a high, it's permeable. It's just in the room. It's buzzing. They come up to me afterwards and they say, thank you. I feel a little bit better. But then, you know, the next morning they're going to wake up and go back to that state of anxiety. And it starts when kids are young. You know, why don't kids play? Because childhood has become big business. So, I mean, you see it. There, there are very few actual toy stores left in America. Um, in Target, we finally got them to stop separating everything by gender but now everything is separated by what developmental skill your child will learn from using this toy that does all the playing for them. 
and that's, you know, I mean, it's, we shake our heads, but that's no joke because when the toy does that, and I say to parents all the time, what do kids like? Tape and boxes. That's what kids like. Give them tape and boxes and they'll make a whole world and they'll play for hours. Give them these toys with all the bells and whistles. They'll play for 15 minutes and move on. Um, but it's because of the marketing. It's, you know, they're going to learn their ABCs. They're going to learn to count. They're going to learn pre-reading skills. What are pre-reading skills? <laughs> Rick, don't answer that. They're, you know, they're going to learn all these things from these toys. So it starts there, but then it becomes about sports. You know, my husband and I were joking the other day, every Saturday morning, we're walking the dog and we see these two-year-olds the shin guards go above their knees. The cleats don't fit because two-year-olds have no business playing soccer, but they're playing <laughs> soccer because they're learning to be soccer players. See them at a hockey rink, you know? So, but parents have been sold the story that kids need to do these things to meet developmental milestones. The expectation gap is enormous right now. And parents feel the pressure to join. I, I am the weird parent. That doesn't join. Peter, you'll be happy to know that my 14-year-old tutors and my my 16-year-old baby says constantly. Um, but you know, it's 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 weird. I'm weird. I'm the outlier in my community, and I know that. I, you know, the flip of that is I sometimes don't see parents uh, caring about feelings. I see a lot of parents who are done with feelings and have decided that kids need to just be super resilient. And so they, you know, tell them, suck it up, get over it deal with yourself and they haven't been taught how to do that. So, and they have, because they didn't have the opportunity to play, they didn't figure it out on their own. So now what? Katie, can so I have, just a quick question, Katie. I, I'm not sure what you meant by the, the expectation gap. Is that the gap between you and other parents or? The expectation gap between what parents think kids are capable of at any given time and what they're actually developmentally capable of. So, <laughs> Parents have been taught that kids need to be reading before they enter kindergarten now, which we know is not actually developmentally appropriate. It's outliers that read before kindergarten. Yeah. 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 So we, you know, when we ask ourselves, why are parents so anxious? I mean, there clearly is an array of answers. Um, but, but one of the reasons why um, parents are so anxious is that they're terribly worried about their kids' success, um, at, which is focused on getting in. That's the big bottleneck, getting into college. Um, and I think that they're worried about it. From, from my reporting and my conversations, parents are worried because the world is sped up. It's especially dynamic. And no one knows what's going to happen. There's a tremendous amount of uncertainty. Um, and anxiety certainly is a, a response to uh, uncertainty. But there are ways, there are constructive ways of dealing with that. Um, and I think Peter and then I would certainly make the argument that I, I think parents are right to be anxious I think that they've glommed onto the wrong solution. And it, it's counterintuitive, but play is one of the things that loosens kids up, builds their brains, and prepares them to create and adapt to the future. And so that's more likely to lead to success than chaining them to chairs um, with all kinds of drugs so that they can study. Um, and I think that it's probably, it probably makes parents anxious to hear that. But I think that's something that they ought to be thinking about. I might interject that, um, you know, it's, um, and, and I'm, I'm hearing this from everybody, we're not blaming parents. <laughs> I don't think we're blaming parents. Uh -huh. Parents are always being blamed, moms especially, you know, and I think part of the, that, that's part of the problem. Moms are afraid of being blamed. <laughs> uh, dads are too, but moms more so because moms get blamed more often. 
And if you do something different, and Katie, you're being kind of courageous here, you're doing something different, somebody's going to blame you. <laughs> if you're doing what everybody else is doing, and even if you're sort of doing what everybody else is doing, but doing more of it, <laughs> you know, more control, more pushing school, more watching them all the time, then everybody thinks you're a super mom. But uh, but I, I, hear from, I hear from mothers who say, so... I'm, I've got my kid at the playground and uh, my kid is doing this and that and the other parents are looking at me like you are letting your child do this or that <laughs> you know and I go and I stop my child I know I shouldn't stop my child but I feel that pressure <laughs> so I think that my son calls this defensive parenting and I think that defensive parenting is a real thing that we get caught in the thing where sometimes even if we believe that what that what the other people are doing is not the best thing to do we still kind of do what other people are doing because we don't want to be seen as as uh, weird or unusual or um, it, it, the other thing is if something did happen to our child and we were doing something very different people would point their fingers at us and say ah that's why of course you know so I don't know if other people you know what comments you have on that and, and general we don't we only have we have about 15 minutes left I'm curious to know what um, what people think we can do about this um, both as individual parents and as a society to the degree that we can influence society. What needs to change to, um, given the realities of today that people have talked about, the reality is that jobs are not secure. You know, it's not the case that you know your child is going to grow up and get a union job and be secure all their life as once was true. Uh, life is in that sense more anxiety provoking i think that affects the parents more than the kids and the and the, in turn the parents are are affecting the kids i'm just curious what people think what's the solution what are some of the solutions here can i jump in i please i just uh, recently finished my doctoral research on the power of using collaborative leadership within families and social communities to care more and rick mentioned this sort of in his last commentary but to uh, work together for a better society, right? To, to get along, to focus on relationships, to focus on relational development, um, getting help when you need help, being a helper when you have the time to be a helper. And there's a lot of good research out there. And we don't, that doesn't happen anymore. Even on team sports, I was an athlete growing up. I actually played hockey for Boston College. And it's, it's so different now in, you know, once upon a time, team sports were this amazing place to grow and develop with your people, with your peers and to get through hard stuff and to deal with conflict and all kinds of stuff. And now it's, I think Hera mentioned it, but it's, it's everybody for themselves, right? It's who's going to be the best to rise to the next level. And that's a shame because that's a, a thing that can be fun and it's play for older kids uh, and it, it can be aggressive and it can be all the good stuff that we want to, you know, and it's, it just doesn't function that way anymore. So I really think the thing we can do <laughs> is reset our compass in terms of who we are and how we interact and how we choose to be together in this world, because we are together in this world. We shouldn't be focusing in these little, si uh, sorry, not focusing, but living in these little silos side by side, we should be, you know, crossing the fence and working together. I would um, make yeah. another suggestion. Um, and I do think connecting kids is a very critical um, counter um, uh, uh, action to a lot of the anxiety. Um, and we need to put kids, we need to get kids collaborating more rather than pushing the, comp pushing the competitiveness on them. Um, but I think one of the things, I think parents immediately can step back when they see their kids struggling with something um, and step back and I know it's painful to watch kids struggle to solve a problem, um, but to step back and be a coach um, 
or a consultant um, to a kid. And I mean, supposing your kid gets a C in history, I mean, how many parents would turn to the kid and say, what do you need to do as well as you want versus how many parents would call the teacher to lobby for a grade change or write a five page email detailing all the ways that the kid's learning style is not being addressed in the class. So I think every parent can do something. I, I think struggles come up all the time, but if parents turn to the kids and find out more of what they need and be the resource for the kid, not the solution. I think that's something every parent can do. Yeah, I, I, Peter, I would just add, I, I, I agree with everything that has been said. And I hope we get a chance to talk to, about social media a little bit too, Peter, if there's if there's time. Um, Go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to launch into it, but I was just going to, I was going to say that you know, I mean, I think the most important thing parents can do is raise kids who are moral, who care about others and who care about a better world. Um, and they should do that because it's the right thing to do and that we will not survive as a society if, if we don't raise kids who are moral. But they should also do it because, you know, as Katie said, if kids have better relationships with other people and care about other people, they're, um, it's it's very therapeutic, I mean, <laughs> in, in lots of ways. Um, they're going to have... Um, they're going to be appreciated and respected more, which is therapeutic, and they're you know going to get out of themselves in ways that are important sometimes. So, um, and I think in in upper class communities, I mean, Katie's point, Harris' point, I mean, some you have to go against the tide sometimes, which is a really hard thing to do. That you know, another example, Peter, consistent with your point, is around something like getting your kid an SAT tutor in, in eighth grade or, or in ninth grade. And you feel like you're cheating your kid if you don't get an SAT tutor in eighth grade. That's crazy, you know? And so I mean, there's time you have to go against the tie. You know? um, and there is also a disease in this country of thinking there are 20 great colleges in the country when there are yeah. colleges, which is a huge part of this problem too. So, I mean, I think there are different kinds of solutions. Um, but anyway, I'm I'm talking too much. I should stop there. But if we want to talk about social media, I would be delighted to do that. I, I can't help but sort of follow up a little bit on what you just said. I, one of the questions that was raised uh, in advance of this by one of the participants is, has to do with the role of schools. What can schools do to help parents move away from micromanaging their child children's lives? I, I think, and I've written a lot about this actually, that schools are a big part of the problem right now. So the schooling has kind of taken over children's lives. The amount of time that children spend in school is way more than it used to be. The, the school year has increased by five weeks over the last few decades. School day has increased. We've taken, we've greatly reduced recess. We're giving homework even to little kids now that we never did in the past. And we're expecting parents to monitor homework. We're putting parents in the task. No longer is it enough if you're a parent just to love your child and feed your child and care for your child emotionally and all of that. You're now supposed to be teaching your child. You're now supposed to be monitoring that homework. Make sure and you're, and you're supposed to be providing them with SAT training and all of this. All for test scores when the tests have very little to do with real life. And uh, it's, it's very hard, I think, for a parent to have a kind of a free attitude about their child when the child's life is being structured so rigidly by school. And I wonder what people think of that and how we could change that if it is a problem. Katie. Uh, I propose a total overhaul of our public schools. I have a daughter in high school, <laughs> and here's a funny story, but when she first started as a freshman last year, I think I got, I don't know, seven or eight emails about how I hadn't set up um, power school. And my kids came from this very hippie liberal private school where they were like playing a lot and doing all sorts of hands-on stuff. So I was not, it was not my strength. But I, the last email said, Dr. Hurley, you have to set up power school for your kid so you can know how she's doing. So I sent her a text and said, hey, Riley, can you just set up a, a fake power school account for me so I can see how you're doing because I'm not interested. So she set up a parent account for me that I never checked. But you know, this is the pressure parents are under. They're, they're under pressure to know exactly the GPA 
Um, and the and I see it. I see it firsthand. It's a great school. It's got all the gold ribbons and and you know blue ribbons and all that jazz. And all they're doing is teaching to pass certain tests. A chemistry exam is a sixty six question multiple choice you know drill and kill exam. I'm not going to remember any of that when she applies to art school in two years time. So it's just, you know, these schools are not, they're set up around parents' schedules. They're set up around meeting, um, you know, certain standards and, and, and passing these tests, you know, getting scores on these tests so they can get more funding and it's backwards and it doesn't serve the kids. And so, you know, but if, if parents, instead of speaking up to individual teachers who are overtaxed and really doing their best, I think, under really difficult circumstances right now, it's very difficult to be a public school teacher right now. A lot of pressure. Uh, they don't want to teach to the test. They want to teach what they know. You know, they, they want to have fun, hands-on environments, and they can't because their job's on the line if they don't get the job done. So, you know, instead of fighting individual teachers, come together and fight the boards and say, you know, we want better for our students. We want hands-on learning. We want deep dive learning in history. Um, you know, we don't want to skim the surface in every class just to get them into some college somewhere. We want them to actually walk away with a love of learning. And that's where parents can raise their voices and be useful, I think. So, the, you know, one, one uh, line of research that reinforces this idea that school is playing a big role is uh, that of, I don't know if you know the research of Sonoya Luther, who has long been studying um, mm -hmm. teenage uh, uh, mental breakdowns, binge drinking, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, she originally was studying this among poverty children in New York City, and she found high rates of these things, no surprise. And then somebody said, well, what's your control group? You haven't compared, how do you know it's poverty? So then she studied, did the same tasks in, among teens in Westchester County in New York, the wealthiest county in um, New York State, as I understand it, found higher rates <laughs> of depression, higher rates of binge drinking, higher rates of anxiety. Then she went on with many other studies and she found that those schools that are called, that, we, that she refers to as high achievement schools, whether they're public schools or private schools, the schools that brag about how high the test scores are and how many get into elite colleges, that's where the rates of anxiety, depression, suicide are the greatest. <laughs> yeah. This is a significant finding and, and it's, it's, as far as I can tell, it's very well done research. <clears throat> I, I would just add, you know, again, I feel like I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a voice for this. Sunaya research I think is, is accurate about, um, about affluent schools and what's going on in affluent schools, but very different things going on in low-income public schools and a lot of other public schools in the country. I mean, and the issues around testing are very different too. Sometimes good assessments can be very important in yeah. um, public schools. Um, you know, the quality of the test matters a lot and what, what teachers are teaching too matters, matters a lot. Um, and, you know, as you know, Peter, I don't, I don't think you're going to disagree with me that the causes are so different in affluent communities of mental health problems and the consequences are so different, too, in terms of the kind of support and resources um, that, that kids have. And we really need more mental health providers in low-income communities and rural communities, especially. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And did, we've only got one minute left. Did you want to say something about social media, Rick, before we uh, end? I, you know, I, the reason that I felt like we should we should talk about it is that you know there are people we we talk about this in our pre call. There are people who think social media is driving this late this latest spike, as you said, Peter. You know, there've been these different spikes, but that this spike began in 2011 in the U.S. and in some other countries, and you do see this. Um, corollary increase in anxiety and depression along the same time that smartphones, smartphones were introduced around 2011, 2012. Um, I think social media is a factor in this. And we've done a meta review of social media research. And, um, you know, it's all over the place from my perspective. There are some research that's saying has almost no effect or no effect. There's some that's saying it has quite a lot. But, you know, when you talk to kids, and as we do, and we do focus with interviews with kids, there are a lot of kids who are saying, you know, are pointing out specific forms of damages, damage that's happening to them on social media and the ways in which it's accelerating um, problems of exclusion and bullying and isolation, but also the curation of the self, the comparison with other kids, 
the creepy things kids are seeing on social media, the hate speech kids are seeing on social media. So I think this is a piece of the problem too. I don't, I certainly don't think it's the only piece, but I think it's a piece of the problem. Thank you for thank you for pointing that out. I, I think it varies a lot. It's uh, and, and I've reviewed the research also, and it is very mixed. Um, all in all, um, probably in my view, not a huge effect overall. But that doesn't mean it's not affecting some people. <laughs> um, I also wonder, the, sort of, about the relationship between being affected by social media and um, what we're talking about, the kind of, um, the kind of um, emotional fragility that comes from lack of experiences that lead to a strong inner core. And I'm wondering if to some extent when people are reacting with depression and anxiety as a result of something they see on social media is if that's the same thing is that really different than when they're at, reacting that way to something that happens outside of social media <laughs> and um, you know and if you're um, if you're have a if you have a stronger core because you you've, you've uh, grown up sort of facing um, facing issues dealing with issues you're less likely to be affected by some snide remark on social media. <laughs> I don't think kids are the only one facing that problem. I mean, I can speak from personal experience. If you're a writer uh, and you put something out there, you're bound to get sniped at by all sides. And I think having the confidence, uh, having confidence built up over years is the best defense against it. Um, as well as not getting uh, social media feeds. And I think it's very hard. I really have tremendous sympathy for the young kids today because they're coming of age at a time when they wanna be connected. They need to be connected. The promise of social media is great and it's wounding many of them partly because of the self comparisons they're making that don't really understand the images they see are highly curated. And because they have this fragile self, they're always looking for their authentic self, like some basic part of them is missing. They're making these negative self comparisons and um, that's wounding. And that's because they haven't had the opportunity to build up that core self at the same time this massive social instrument is thrust at them with great promise. I don't, I don't blame them for for leaping at it. It's really hard to resist. I think I've just I've got a message here that we uh, actually we're now down. Uh, we've used up a little bit more than the forty five minutes we're supposed to use for talking. So I think it's time for us to turn it over to questions uh, uh, from the participants. There is a question in the Q&A about social media. That makes you feel better. So Rick was right on to oh, <laughs> end <good>. with that. <laughs> <laughs> so what have we got here for um, questions? I'm looking at the question. So So when, there's a question here, uh, how much does the decline of free range kids with free play contribute to children's self-actualization? I'm a landscape architect and this question comes up in park, camp and playground design. Um, does anybody want to address that? <clears throat> Could you repeat the question again? So, so the, I th the way I would interpret the question is that um, the, what is the play landscape out there? If we're trying to do some urban planning, we're trying to we're trying to make things more inviting for play, more, you know, um, some of the this is specifically about parks and camps and playgrounds. But I think in general, I mean, what I what I've seen over time is there are fewer sidewalks. <laughs> uh, there's hard, it's hard for children. There used to be a lot of vacant lots. We just go out and play in vacant lots. Um, the the um, 
there's there's less places for kids to just go and play in a sense um a lot of the where it used to be parks uh where maybe there would i, I remember parks where in even in small towns where i lived where there'd be a cop in the park who a, a, an old-fashioned friendly car cop who would make sure that it's safe and parents could leave their kids off there and uh, we'd play. Um, now you don't see that. And you don't see playground directors uh, in public parks where the, they're just there to hand out stuff and make sure things are safe and parents could leave. We're not putting much effort into that. Um, sometimes I think parks are being designed more with the adults in mind to look beautiful than, and what kids like is junk, <laughs> you know, the, uh, the, the so-called uh, junk playgrounds or adventure playgrounds they're called where there's old tires and boards and things you can climb and parents are not allowed in uh, those are there's a growing movement to that a little bit but they're still very rare that's something that I see as one possible change I don't want yeah, to dominate been, this go ahead there have been I think there are two things happening concurrently on the one hand, you do have this movement toward adventure playgrounds, moving parts and playgrounds. On the other hand, you have the dumbing down of playgrounds. Um, I mean, I've seen in my own neighborhoods, playgrounds change from having these whirly things that you had to jump on and jump off. Um, yes, a small degree of risk involved in this, um, but that was taken away. Um, and then what you have is all the structures, the climbing structures are now much shorter. They have these pyramid tops to look taller, but the structures have just been diminished so that they're of interest to two-year-olds when it used to be the 10 year olds would be playing actively in playgrounds. So it's dramatically changed. Um, but I will say that there, the playground and play people um, very actively are moving. Um, there's definitely a movement to go in the opposite direction. And I've seen some pretty amazing playgrounds. So we got, let me uh, take another question here. Um, so uh, considering how important time play is in a brain builder, why are the schools often reducing recess rather than looking for ways to increase it? That's probably a fairly direct answer to that, and that's test scores. We've become obsessed with test scores. If somebody has a different answer from that, uh, and so, we're sacrificing children's play, we're sacrificing the more creative aspects of school uh, for the kind of direct teaching uh, that uh, presumably will increase test scores. I'm not even convinced it does that. I think it definitely burns children out, but that's my opinion. Any other <laughs> thoughts on that question? But there's no question but what. Uh, school has been, you know, recesses have been declining. Um, school is taking more and more of children's time, so they have less and less time after school. And then we're putting children into school-like activities even when they're not in school. So d adult directed sports, karate lessons, um, Chinese music. We're taking music. away music and took, you know we took all away music and art. We took away the, those kinds of things. Yeah. yeah, and and then we're surprised. There's actually data. The, this was published by a researcher named Kim. Uh, his last name is Kim. A few years ago, it was on t cover of Time magazine. If I remember the creativity crisis, she had uh, she had analyzed scores on uh, on the there's a there's uh, there's a, a standard set of tests for creativity believe it or not, which is, uh, which is valid because it predicts creativity in adulthood. The scores on these tasks over this same period of time that we've, been take, that we've taken away recess, that we've been overprotecting children, that we have been declining play, no surprise tests on this, scores on this test of creativity have gone down by large amount. So that at the time she published that article, which was uh, a few years ago, 
the uh, average scores on this test of creativity for school-age children was a full standard deviation below what it had been 30 years earlier. That's a huge decline. That means basically that the average score uh, at the time she did uh, that analysis was, uh, would have been at the 15 percentile level uh, back uh, 30 years earlier. So, you know, we're living at a time when creativity is more important than it's ever been before for the job market. You know, the, we've got computers and robots to do the non-creative stuff, and yet our schools have changed in ways that is reducing creativity. Well, to Rick's earlier points that he's repeated a couple of times, I mean, not, we do have an equity problem in our schools. And so not all schools have the funding for the arts and the music. And often those are the first things to go, which is a shame um, for sure it's necessary, but um, those are typically two of the first things to get cut from a budget when they need to get the teaching hours in. And so, you know, I, I often wish we could reallocate funds uh, to make sure that, you know, kids are getting those enrichment activities that they need in the safety of their schools. So let's see, there's a, another question here. Um, <clears throat> does research support that single children may be more liable to be more of wimps than warriors? Anybody have any knowledge about the research in this realm? Um, I don't specifically know of any research on this in this area. I, I think I do think you know in the past it didn't matter too much if you were a single child because you just went outdoors and there's lots of other kids. <laughs> now, if you're a single child, do you? may not have much interaction with other kids unless you've got siblings, um, except in school where there's not much interaction, there's reduced interaction because there's not much recess anymore. There's not much time really to interact as kids with one another. I do hear, I do think there's a, I, th I think there's a difference between siblings and other friends in that siblings are stuck with you <laughs> uh, and you're stuck with them. Uh, you can bully them and they don't go away. <laughs> uh, friends, you've got to earn. And so I think that it's really, really important that children have the opportunity to be interacting with other children away from adults where they have to learn how to get along with their peers. So that's kind of my response to that. And I think that's true whether you're a single child or whether you have siblings. Susan Newman uh, follows a lot of the research on single children and, and mm -hmm. how they thrive without siblings. Uh, she has a great blog for Psychology Today. You know that. So she's she's a person to look up her blog on Psychology Today and just follow her work because that's a special interest to her. But I also think it's worth noting that there is a movement in um, classrooms for group think. And so often you'll see in early el elementary, early ed now that desks are clustered in you know groups of four or they're at tables and so the, you know it's not no interaction and yes it's more prescriptive but it's it's not no interaction their kids are group thinking and talking and making jokes on the side when they're supposed to be listening in classrooms everywhere good any other any other questions from um that anybody in the uh, among the listeners uh, wants to add. I'm not seeing um, seeing any new ones here. Well, I'm the, uh, uh, unexpectedly, the social media guy. There, there is a question about restricting kids from using a phone, from phone use. And those of you who are closer to, like, Katie, you're, you're closer to this than, than I am in terms of... <laughs> But um, I've become to think, and I'm interested in what others think, that we should be banning cell phones from schools for period. Um, mm -hmm. And that we should be restricting. I mean, parents should generally not let their kids on, be on social media after some time at night, at not, after nine o'clock or something like that. Um, there's just outrageous amounts of social media use that are going on. And, um, and all the things that Hera mentioned and I mentioned can be damaging. 
So I think this is a good thing to get on top of. I'd be interested in what other folks think. It's a wild west out there with the cell phone use in schools. <laughs> I mean, it is wild. I mean, they are on social media. They're cheating on tests. They're Googling answers. It's like, it's they're, and it's really watching, hard to, watching, to control. Watching, you know, watching porn too at the back. Of the they're room. watching porn. Absolutely. Um, you know, when you were talking earlier, I didn't chime in because we were running low on time. But eating disorders are spiking right now, and um, self-image is an issue, and social media. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation about nutrition it, on social media, on Instagram, on TikTok. A lot of I'm undoing, untangling a lot of uh, knots in terms of what teenagers in particular think that they're learning versus what is actually being told to them by people who don't have the expertise to sell them such things. So there's just a lot out there. I think ideally we would want to figure out how to shut it down in schools really hard, depending on the size of the school. Um, I always tell parents, just bit, you know, everybody, parents included, should be turning in the phones at eight o'clock at night. Just, you know, turn them off. We, we don't need them either. You know, it, it affects parents too. And that's, you know, Harold was talking about um, her own experiences as a writer. It affects parents too, the comparison culture of, oh, look at my family is doing so well. What's yours doing? So, you know, I think a number of schools have banned um, cell phones during school. Colleges have tried to. I was I was giving a talk at a um, private parochial school um, one day and a uh, kid um, was brought into the principal's, the headmaster's office um, because um, she was using her cell phone. Um, and what they do, what the kids do is they wear Uggs so they can tuck their cell phones into the Uggs. So they have two phones. They surrender one phone when they come in and then they have another phone that they tuck into their, to their boot. This was a particularly yeah. heinous example because the kid was on the phone. Actually, the mother had texted the child um, during school hours. This was so shocking to me. The mother had texted the kid that, <laughs> honey, I'm at the mall, I'm so bored. And the kid was in school. I mean, the, and I mean, the parent should just never have been doing that. But I was also struck by the fact that um, the epidemic of UGG wearing boots had to do with hiding uh, the contraband cell phone. This is uh, interesting. I mean, uh, another of the downsides of the cell phone, the one I'm more concerned about, to be honest, is that it is a huge umbilical cord between the mom and the kid that I see, I was seeing even back when I was teaching some years ago, the Get the college students were talking to their mom or their dad about every class, asking for help about, you know, you're supposed to be independent now, you're supposed to be away. The cell phone is being used to track kids. You can't, there's no privacy anymore for young people. I, I think that's a, yeah. that's a very big concern. I, I think, I worry that if we take the social media away from kids, we have totally deprived them of being able to interact with other kids. We're not letting them outside. We're not letting them hang. We're not, you know, when my son was a kid some years ago, there'd be gangs of kids walking around in shopping malls. They'd be interacting. Teenagers need that. They need interaction with other kids. If you can't get it in the real world and you can't get it over the, on screens, you, you're not getting it. And marginalized youth in particular get, uh, find a lot of connection online. Well, a lot of good things, a lot of good things are happening online. You know, yeah. LGBTQI kids are finding other LGBT. Yes. Yep. So, so I, I, I think I think this is I happen. think there's a balance here. I think your points have been well taken, Rick. I just think there's some people in our culture are really kind of demonizing screens and cell phones, and I think we don't want to demonize them. There's a lot of benefits to them. And I think we should always be thinking, instead of restricting our children's menu more, <laughs> let's open up the menu. Let's open up the menu. There are more, there are kids who would want to get together in reality with their friends if they could, <laughs> rather than over the, over the screens. Well, we have to, we have to stop. I, I, 
Peter, I have a somewhat different sense of this than you do. I, I, I do think that there are many communities where kids are still interacting in person. I do think we should be restricting cell phone use um, because it's, got, it's gotten out of control and we should be encouraging kids to get off their cell phones to be interacting, you know, to the extent we can, which is very uphill, to get off their cell phones to be interacting in person. So anyway. I, I, I certainly agree there are situations, the same is true for adults. <laughs> <laughs> We're on cell phones too much. So, I, well, our time is up. And um, I guess we turn it over to uh, Gavin at this point to say goodbye yes, to us all. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all so much. Um, as a parent, um, I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. And as a JCC professional and someone who's curious about this world, uh, you've certainly raised a lot of questions and surfaced um more research that certainly I wasn't aware of around sort of those dualities and connection points between the influence of culture on parenting and the influence of parenting on culture, which I think will eventually inform what our future looks like. Um, so there's a lot to think about as a parent, but also as just a curious individual um, and what our future holds for us, for our children um, and for society. So, uh, Lots of food for thought. Thank you for everything that you've each brought to this conversation. And thank you to everyone um, listening in. And thank you for joining us uh, at the JCC and GBH for Hot Buttons. Cool conversations. Thank, thank you. you.